in reconstructing Iraq has decided that companies like Parsons, companies like Bechtel, companies like ECCI, all from California, are not doing a good job. So they've, sub, they've directly hired the Iraqi companies. It's much safer, and it, it puts more money back into the economy. And the, the GRD, the Gulf Regional Division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, I met with them in Baghdad, they said, we're seeing much better work done because we're working directly with the local people. Now, the, the, tell us about this, this new company, L3, the subject of your uh, report, Outsourcing Intelligence in Iraq. Well, um, uh, Juan, this is a company that ha had uh, a multi-billion dollar contract to provide translators, translators like uh, Marwan here, uh, to work in the field and provide that critical nexus between uh, soldiers and between the local Iraqi pop pop population. Most recently, about three years ago, they got a $426.5 million contract to provide intelligence, analysts, screeners, interrogators in Iraq. Now, the problem the military has is they're hiring a company for intelligence that is either not very clever or they're deaf. They're deaf to the needs of their translators who are getting injured. This, this is 280 translators have died. This is a rate 50 percent higher than the military itself. Uh, by died, you mean have been killed? Have been killed in Iraq, mostly Iraqi nationals. They're, they are not listening to soldiers who want to be able to communicate and find out what's happening in Iraq, and they most certainly are not listening to Iraq, Iraqis who are being thrown in. the 25,000 prisoners in, in Iraq. And the, because these, a lot of these translators, you know, either don't speak very good English or very good Arabic, what happens is there's a communication. Gap. I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, I was in a camp, I won't name where, in Iraq, where I met a Titan translator. And we were listening to the mortar fire outside. And I said to the translator, I said, how do you say there's incoming mortar fire in Arabic? And this look of panic descended upon him because he couldn't translate that. And he rushed out to find somebody to find out how to say incoming mortar fire. Mm -hmm. You have, we, we have a problem here. Bad intelligence costs lives, and that's really what you're getting from L3. I mean, and, and in fact, the U.S. military has, it took them nine years to do it, but they yanked 80 percent of the new contract for translation, a $4.6 billion contract. Unfortunately, 20 percent of the contract still remains with the company in this joint venture with Dynco, who is supposed to be their rival. So these companies sort of stitch it up. They, 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 they work with each other. Yesterday, when I was in, uh, at the annual meeting, I ran into uh, the four-star General Carl Vuono, who runs the military training program, I said, General, aren't you worried that you are doing a bad job by the military? I mean, these guys were fired from training the Iraqi army in, 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 in Kirkuk, uh, and Kirkush, rather, in 2004. Uh, Marlon Mawiri, you were recruited to, be, uh, to work for L3. Could you tell us about your experience, how you got involved, and what your duties were there? Well, uh, what happened is uh, Titan, uh, back in 2002, 2003, stopped putting these at that. They're looking for qualified linguists to come out and help uh, in providing services to uh, the U.S. Uh, government and <clears throat> Department of Defense. And these ads were in Iraq or? No, no. Uh, U.S. Here? national, in, yes. okay. U.S. citizens and green card holder. I'm a U.S. citizen, so I responded to the ad and I called the company. I said I was interested in this job. What do I need to do? It was a very simple conversation for less than a minute. This, uh, in, in, in less than a minute's conversation, my Arabic uh, language skill was tested, my English language skill was tested, and I passed. And that was the case with hundreds of uh, hired, uh, you know, that were hired in the U.S. And when we got to Washington, D.C., and we start going through the hiring process, you know, I was shocked and surprised that many of the people they hired inside the United States, if you were just to give them a simple Arabic language test or an English language test to see how proficient they are in translations, they will not pass. I mean, we literally had people who needed help filling out their employment application. Uh, we needed, you know, we were, I was helping some of the people they hired to fill out their, you know, background investigation, you know, application. And uh, when we got to, you know, uh, to the field and when we got deployed to our assignment, you know, I was surprised that we never had any training even before we, we you know, we, we took on this assignment, nor we got training when we got to our field. And we had to deal with, you know, incompetent— no, no training about what to expect in Iraq or— uh, No training what to expect in Iraq, no training what the field work going to look like, no training on how you should be translating in a proper manner, uh, no training even how to deal with— uh, a simple thing when it comes to, you know, what if you had issues and problem, uh, you know. And what was more shocking is even the, the, the site manager or the so-called site manager they had, you know, uh, in the field, 
were unskilled, unqualified. I mean, some of these people literally had no experience even in managing more than three, four, five people. Uh, one of the site manager we dealt with was a truck driver. Uh, one of the site manager that we dealt with was, I think his rank was a sergeant who probably handled a handful of soldiers before he, and, you know. And what were you, what were you paid by them? At the time, uh, the pay range was between sixty to a hundred thousand mm dollars. -hmm. And uh, once you were deployed in Iraq, what did you do? Uh, I provided uh, translation and language services to uh, the Army. I was attached with uh, Brigade 173rd out of Italy, Airborne. And I was stationed in Kirkuk and the surrounding areas, and I helped out in a lot of effort in reconstruction, the, you know, the government, uh, so reestablished social order. I also helped out and established with the help of uh, Battalion uh, uh, 108, uh, which is a, a, a branch of 173rd Airborne, in establishing the first police academy after the invasion. And we were able to train, you know, approximately two to 3,000 police officers and uh, Iraqi Defense Forces and trying to get them ready to handle their own, uh, you know, and, and the degree of danger, obviously, some 200 uh, translators have, uh, were killed from the company, because you were obviously exposed to the same kind of dangers that a lot of the, t yes. the troops were, right? We were, we were frontline translator. We were embedded with the soldiers. Wherever the soldier went, we went, whether it was, you know, a civil affair, uh, you know, a mission or, uh, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, mission raid or, you know, you know, I mean, we were there. We were taking bullets, we know, you know, we were the soldiers, so wherever the soldier went, we went. And, you know, what was so amazing that the company has promised that they will provide us with body armors, they will provide us with special, you know, uniforms that will keep us protected, but that never happened. Uh, and Perth, what kind of uh, oversight uh, for a company like uh, L3 or Titan has occurred so far? Well, there's very little oversight, and this is a question we've been asking the military for a long time. And it literally, the contract ended, the original Titan transition contract ended in 2004. It's taken four years to get them out of place and move another company. So it's very hard. I mean, the problem here is that bad contracting, and because there's poor oversight, costs lives. And more than that, it costs, I mean, not more than that, but equally, it costs a lot of dollars, a lot of taxpayer dollars. And you you, it is not good for Iraqis or for Americans to have companies that don't listen to their client, the military, or to us, the taxpayer. Uh, and uh, the, in terms of the, have you talked to Congress, members of Congress, about this at all? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of, uh, I know that the Democratic Policy Committee, for example, in the Senate, which you mentioned had hearings, they are planning to look into this issue of L3 and Titan. The fact that the company is providing screeners who are in charge of finding out who gets onto the base and who doesn't, whose, rec whose, whose experience is working at a Saf Safeway checkout counter. You know, these are the people we're putting to decide whether or not, no experience in screening except maybe working at a, as a baggage screener at, at, at an airport. It, it's a problem. Well, I want to thank you uh, both for being with us. Perthap Chatterjee, investigative journalist, author, and managing editor of Corp Watch, released a report yesterday called Outsourcing Intelligence in Iraq. And Marwan Mawiri worked as a translator with Titan in Iraq in 2003 and 2004. And that does it for today's program. I'm Juan Gonzalez. Amy Goodman will be hosting the show from Los Angeles tomorrow. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Democracy Now! Uh, Amy will be in Vermont this weekend as Democracy Now! continues on tour. She'll be at the Borders Bookstore in Burlington on Saturday afternoon, the Old Labor Hall in Barrie, Saturday evening, Sunday afternoon on North Shore Books in Manchester, and Sunday in, in Troy, New York. Thanks.